Well, I'm not going to share any details online. However, I am going to share with the body of Christ some cool stuff. So, how many have been watching the news? <laughs> how many of you have been avoiding the news? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's good reason, uh, obviously, because um, depending on what side of the political fence you're on, it's either good news or bad news. Or depending on what station you watch, it's either good news or bad news. Like, devastatingly. Uh, it's not just a little bit like it's going to rain tomorrow. I mean, it's, you know, um, the nuclear warhead kind of... No, I'm just kidding. There's no nuclear stuff going on, but... But here's the thing that here's the thing that I want us to to, to focus on and really be uh, attentive to attentive to is this: Do you know that God is still on the throne? Do you know that God is still up to things? Do you know that God also is, if we are willing, allowing the Church of God to? Are you ready? Bring a little harvest. Amen. As a matter of fact, here's the cool thing about God's uh, plan for us as a church. He gives illustration in the New Testament, lots of illustration, and one of those is farming, right? You're either a sower or you're a reaper, a harvester, right? You can do both, but generally you're doing one or the other. Uh, God is the one that waters. God is the one that causes the increase, right? But here's the thing. I think sometimes um, there's... This enemy we call Satan, the Bible calls him Satan, so we call him the same thing, right? And he's an enemy, he's not a friend of ours at all. As a matter of fact, he's in absolute opposition to anything to do with God, right? So think about this for just a minute. If you are just frustrated with your farmer neighbor, and you want to wreck his life, one of the things that you want to do with the farmer neighbor is you want to distract him when the harvest is ready. You do. You want to get in his face. You want to do things to make sure that he's not paying attention to the harvest. Right? And so listen, I don't know about you, I want to be a good farmer. I want to harvest when God says it's time to harvest. I want to know when the fruit is ripe. Because do you know that there are people out there that are ready for Jesus? I know by experience. There are people right now that are ready for Jesus. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. We can get so caught up in the stuff, myself included, that all of a sudden I'm not paying attention to the harvest that's in front of me. Amen? So here's my encouragement to the church. And when we're offline, I'll give you some more details. There's stuff going on right now, ladies and gentlemen, that is awesome. People are hungry for God. Amen? Especially when they see Christians standing on the foundation of Jesus Christ because his foundation doesn't move. No matter what happens in life, God's foundation, Christ, does not move. Amen? And if you want to, read the end of chapter 7 in the book of Matthew because, listen, if you're firmly planted on the foundation of Christ, his word, acting on that, the winds are going to come, the rains are going to come, the floods are going to come, just as if you planted your house on the sand. The winds will come, the rains will come, the floods will come. So one of the things that Jesus tells us right away is that it doesn't matter where you're planted, the winds are going to come, the rains are going to come, the floods are going to come, period. It's just life. That's where we live, right? But here's the difference. When it comes and you're standing on the rock, guess what? You stand tall. When you're standing in the sand means you don't have Christ as your foundation. You don't have his word as your foundation. Then the Bible says that when these things come in, guess what? You get so overwhelmed that you're broken. How many of you know that Jesus came to restore the broken? And he not only came to restore the broken, but he also gave the broken the ability to stand strong in the middle of a storm. Amen? So my heart today for all of us is, and I can't wait till we're offline, sorry, um, but people are ready. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray in a few minutes, and then I'm going to introduce the Carlsons. Looking forward to hearing what God's put in his heart. And I got a chance to meet Macy, and uh, she seems like a really nice, a nice girl. 
Um, glad that they're married, glad that they have ministry uh, in front of them. I'm so excited, especially I've known the Carlsons for a zillion years. Um, it's just nice to see. It's, it's awesome. But anyway, so listen, one of the things that I want to share with you right now, and then we're going to pray. How many of you have at different times in your life had a difficulty trusting Jesus? Anybody? I, th- I think we can all safely say we've had difficulty in trusting Jesus, right? So let me turn it around. How can absolute perfection not be trusted? How can the imperfect not trust the absolute perfection? Well, let's turn it around. Have you ever thought for a moment that it's much harder for God to trust me than it is for me to trust him? See, the Bible says that even though I can be unfaithful, he can't because he can't deny himself. He is trustworthy. So why am I saying that? When it comes to obeying the faith, sharing the gospel, discipling, those things, doing Christian stuff, right, especially in the public, when it comes to doing that stuff, aren't there times where we're like, okay, Jesus, are you sure you want me to, you know, share the gospel with this person or whatever? Uh, Turn it around. Can you pray this way? Lord Jesus, can I be found trustworthy with your word today? Can you trust me with a soul? Because, Lord, you're going to be bringing souls in my path. Can you trust me with them? And so, Lord, I ask you, please trust me. Please trust me. And, Lord, if for some reason I do fail, you know my weaknesses. I am not not you, but I have you in me, and so I need your help. And so, Lord, if for some reason I blow your trust today, would you strengthen me today to continue this day so that I don't blow your trust? May I be found trustworthy, Lord, when you bring a soul to me. Because I'm going to trust in your Holy Spirit that you're going to bring up the scripture that I need for the moment. Your spirit is going to do that which Jesus, you claimed he would. You're going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You're just going to use me as a conduit. So, Lord, I'm asking you this morning, can you trust me to do that which you want me to do? Because you are trustworthy. You are all trustworthy. You are perfect, and I'm imperfect. And I should never distrust you for any reason at all. May you trust me, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. That changes everything. It changes everything. Children's ministry, have a blast. You can be, ex- you can be uh, sent down unless you're going to keep them up here, and that's entirely up to you. You're going to keep them up here? Cool, because you're going to see some real live missionaries. This is awesome. Why don't you guys come on up? So for those of you that don't know, this is Jonathan Carlson and his lovely bride, Macy. You've been married how long now? A year. A year. A year. Wow. You're almost oldlyweds. No, <laughs> no. So um, for those of you that don't know, uh, John and his parents' family used to come here. They came here for about six, seven years, I think. Um, I've known Jonathan's dad since um, 1999 or 2000 uh, when he was pastoring in Bethel. And so I saw John when he was really, really little, and uh, actually before Pete was born. So, um, but anyways, his parents are in ministry, and it's good to see that God's call is on his life, on their lives as a couple. Um, and so uh, I've already been told that you were prepared for the Carlsons. You got a good sense of humor, which you got to have, because if you don't, you know, forget it, you know. Um, but uh, anyways, so they're going to share in song. And then they're going to share the word, and uh, looking forward to hearing them. So glad you guys could come, man. That's awesome. Good to see you. Macy, good to meet you. All right. So if you want to grab your mic. Truth, that word still rings true today, does it not? That Jesus, it's really only him that makes the darkness tremble. And I know at times, for me, I grew up in the church. I, I've heard these things before, and there's times where the, the basic truths of scripture just need to be sounded and reminded to each and every one of us. Amen. So I can share a small little detail before I get going. I I can appreciate that Pastor Kevin is loud and demonstrative because I'm the same way. So it makes me feel comfortable to share in a way that is natural for me. So you guys are already prepared. Um, So I can share a little bit how the Lord is on the move, specifically in Chi Alpha. And then I can't wait to hear what Pastor Kevin has to say before. So for those of you who don't know, Chi Alpha is the Assemblies of God's 
mission arm to university students, specifically here on U.S. campuses. They have them across the globe, but really the focus is here in the United States. And they have this thing every year. They didn't have it during the coronavirus year for obvious reasons. But this last year we went to, it was called RUI, Reach the University Institute. It's a week-long training that you have to go through. And while we were there, there are U.S. missionaries. Now, these are full-blown missionaries. They raise their own support. They're, full, they're appointed onto a university campus. And when they counted up the entire body of students that were there, you didn't really realize this because you're all broken up into pods, but after they counted them, there were over 430 new Chi Alpha missionaries that this year are going to be moving into university campuses. Can I tell you this morning, God's church is still on the move. God's people are still on the move. God hasn't left a generation behind, but he said, I've called you, I've appointed you, and now I'm sending you out into the darkness to reach the lost lambs of Jesus Christ. In Chi Alpha, we have this thing we call it find, feed, and fight. And right now, at this moment, there are, all, there are over 430 new missionaries who are finding, feeding, and fighting for the last lambs of Jesus Christ. Right now, can I tell you that God is still on the move? And Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, is still the only thing that makes the darkness tremble. Over 430 new missionaries just in Chi Alpha who are reaching their hands into students' lives and saying, you have a purpose, and you have a destiny, and God has a plan for your life, and it doesn't matter what you're going through. He still has a purpose for your life, and can I move that before I even get going? God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. It doesn't matter what you've gone through so far. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. It doesn't matter how you're feeling. The God of the 15 billion light year universe came to tell, tell me to tell you that he still has a plan and a purpose for your life. Regardless of what these last two years have looked like, he still has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you have your Bibles, then you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be spending our time this morning is Galatians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 11. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say give me a minute. Everybody's got it. We're going to start reading in verse 11. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man. Well, Galatians chapter 1, now we're in verse 12. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, beyond my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born... And who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of darkness, you still move in a powerful way. I thank you that regardless of our past, you present us with a future covered by your son's blood, Jesus Christ. So I ask now that you would anoint the words, that they would transform us, that they would motivate us to reach into the lost world that's around us. We love you, Father. In your son's name we pray. Amen. In 1907, Theodore Roosevelt, the president at the time, presided over the placing of the very first center stone for the National Cathedral. My wife and I, Macy, had the opportunity to travel down to Washington, D.C. for our one-year anniversary, which was a blast. I got to experience all that beauty and wonder with the most beautiful thing that's walking around this planet right now, my wife. And the, amen, thank you. <clears throat> and while we were there, we had the opportunity to visit the National Cathedral. And it was beautiful. If you've never seen it, it's, it's truly breathtaking. 
And as we were walking around, it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining, the breeze, the trees. There were beautiful gardens everywhere. People were just admiring the beauty of this particular building. And there was an inscription that we stumbled upon, and it read this. The cathedral was modeled on medieval cathedrals built in the 14th century. The distinctive arches and buttresses of the Gothic style allowed churches to rise higher and feature more windows, letting more light in. Catch this part. Everything was designed to draw your attention upward toward heaven and to reflect God's majesty. I'm going to read that again. Everything was designed to draw your attention upward toward heaven and to reflect God's majesty. And that was our experience while Macy and I were there. We walked up next to this beautiful building. It was totally breathtaking. And as we saw the arches and the windows and the structure, we were automatically just drawn upward. And I didn't really know why until I read that. The Lord dropped it in my spirit and he reminded me, he said, listen, my presence no longer dwells in temples like this, but rather in dwells inside of you. So what would it look like if you and I lived our lives in such a way as this cathedral did that drew people's attention upward and reflected God's character. And that's what I want to dive into a little bit today. How exactly do we live our lives in such a way that reflects God's character and directs people's attention upward because his spirit is alive on the inside of us? And I believe that Paul helps us figure this out in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. If we're going to live our lives in such a way that directs people's attention upward and reflects the character and the majesty of God. Number one, if you're taking notes, we need to have a divine revelation. Let's read it in Galatians chapter 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But Paul writes, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul was writing this particular book of the Bible to refute primarily religious teachers. And what these religious teachers at the time, these false prophets, were communicating was that in addition to Jesus Christ, you needed to follow the Jewish law of circumcision. And that's how you were saved. And what Paul is trying to communicate to these new believers in Galatia is that the only thing that you need, what we just sang about this morning, is Jesus is the gospel, is his sacrifice on the cross. That's all you need. But there were these false prophets that wanted to attach what I would call man's gospel, what Paul calls man's gospel, to this gospel of Jesus Christ and him alone. Can I tell you that right now, in this moment in history, we see people attaching gospels to the gospel, don't we? If we would just ascribe to a certain political agenda, and I'm not here to make a statement, I'm here to make an observation, that we will have unity in our world, in, in our nation. And what have we seen over these last two years? In my lifetime, some of the greatest division that we've ever seen. Macy and I now primarily spend most of our time with students between the ages of 18 to 34, and what we found is that for students in that age group, for people in that age group, the second leading cause of death is suicide. What we found is that students now, during their four years at a university, one in ten of them, 10%, will seriously contemplate or attempt committing suicide. If there was a gospel that was going to work, that was going to be presented, other than what Paul had revealed to him it would have worked by now, and what we're seeing is it's not, and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. If you and I are going to live our lives in such a way to reflect people's attention upward and to reflect God's character, we need to have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And Paul had that. We read about it in Acts chapter 9. We know the story. He was on his way to Damascus with letters to persecute the church. And scripture says that suddenly Jesus broke into his life and transformed him. I want to make a small side note. Oftentimes, we are very 
humanistic in our approach to the gospel. What do I mean by that? I mean that for myself, at times I believe that the Lord doesn't move until I turn towards him. What do we see in Paul's life? That's not the case. Paul was on his way to commit atrocities, and Jesus broke into his life. Without him, he wasn't looking for that. Jesus said, I love you so much that the guy who is rounding up my earliest followers, I'm going to break into his life. I love Pastor Kevin's heart for evangelism because that is what we are doing when we evangelize. Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God, is mobilizing us to reach into the hearts and lives of people just like Jesus did with Paul and say, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus Christ still has a plan for your life. And that revelation is what Paul had of who Jesus was, and it motivated him to communicate that gospel to those who are lost and broken. If you and I are going to live our lives in such a way, to direct people's attention, just like that beautiful cathedral upward towards heaven, and reflect the character of Jesus Christ like Paul did. We need to have a revelation, a fresh revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Many of us here are believers. I've been married for a year, so I found out that I know nothing. I've been, I've been in it just long enough to figure out I don't know a thing, although I still act like I do. Any other husbands in the room that still act like you got it all figured out? Nobody else? All right, that's fine. I'll, I'll come ask you questions after. When Macy and I first started dating, and I'm sure anybody, whether it's a best friend or a new hobby or a relationship or whatever, when you're new to that thing, it's captivating, right? When Macy and I first got together, when I first, spend, when I first started to spend time with her, I was captivated by who she is. And the blessing that she is in my life. And, and, I, and I gave up lots of things that I loved, whether it was working out or watching football or eating far too much food or hanging out with my friends. Why? Because the reality of who she is in my life was captivating. I gave up anything to be with her. But what anybody knows here, if you're in a relationship, unless you work on that, that begins to wane. So a year in. I'm already working out more. I'm already watching football more. I'm already not going to the mall probably as much as I should, which are not bad things. But the proximity of her and the extended amount of time that I've had with her, all of a sudden that revelation of who she is in my life begins to wane unless I'm very intentional about reviving that, right? Can I tell you, it has been my experience, and I would say if we're honest, it would be our experience that as we traverse through this relationship with Jesus Christ, the revelation of the gospel, the revelation of his love, the revelation of his mercy, the revelation of the free grace that was extended to us begins to diminish, doesn't it? It begins to get familiar. I begin to be able to go through my day not thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. My prayer for myself, my prayer for us this morning is may we not become familiar with the God that we barely know. May we not become familiar with the God that we barely know. We need to have a divine revelation. Secondly, if you're taking notes, we need to have a divine zeal. Let's look in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 1. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Verse 14. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. That word in the original language is to vehemently uphold the thing. We see this in Paul's life. Paul's talking about his former life in Judaism when he was persecuting the church. We'll read about it in Acts 9. What I want to propose, though, is that that divine zeal never left when Paul got saved. 
How do I know that? Because there's places in Scripture that describe some of the things that the Apostle Paul walked through as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which illustrates the level of passion and zeal that he pursued his calling with, his life with. And the main passage that I want to look at to illustrate that is found in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, we're going to look at it in verse 23 of chapter 12. Paul says, are they servants of Christ? Speaking of the false apostles, Paul comments, I'm a better one. He goes on to say, with far greater laborers, with far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, with countless beatings. Paul saying that with countless beatings, I endured for the sake of the gospel. When we begin to understand what those beatings might have looked like, that denotes a public calamity. So, so Paul didn't just experience persecution in private, but oftentimes they would drag him before the towns, before the city squares, and he would be beaten and publicly humiliated for the gospel. Can I say in my own life, there have been times where the Lord has directed me to a certain individual or a certain situation and have backed down. Why? Because I feared public calamity and public humiliation. I live in Missouri now, which the Lord has his hand mightily on. So oftentimes there's far more believers there than there are in a place like this. But there will be times where you and I will have to make a decision and say, I realize what this might do to my reputation. I realize what this family member or friend might think of me if I communicate this truth that's found in Scripture. This was, an, this was a constant reality for Paul. We're going to see maybe why Paul lived with such a zeal and a passion in a minute, but this, these, these beatings, this public humiliation, the way he lived his life was a constant thing for Paul. Paul wasn't an undercover Christian. And there are times and circumstances where the Lord directs us to speak and move in different ways. So by no means am I trying to speak haphazardly. But there will be times where if we want to live our lives with a passion and a zeal the way Paul did, that we will have to communicate and it will result in an unfavorable outcome. Paul goes on to say, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashings minus one. Oftentimes what this would look like is the individual would be pulled out across a large stone and he would receive a third of the lashings on his physical chest. Two-thirds of them would be on his back. He said five times I received the 30 lashings minus one. What's very interesting is oftentimes the reason why this particular punishment was administered was because there was somebody who was in the Jews' eyes, in the religious leaders' eyes, blaspheming the name of the Lord. Have you ever tried to communicate the gospel and been really misunderstood and punished for it? Have you ever tried to be communicating God's love to somebody and they don't receive it that way? And they get upset or they get angry or they get confused. We've all experienced that, right? This is exactly what was happening with Paul. Paul was trying to reason with his brothers, the Jews, saying, this is, this is releasing you from the bondage that you have of trying to keep all these laws. But oftentimes he received the very punishment for blaspheming the very God that he was trying to communicate to them. That's staggering, right? There's going to be times where we share the gospel. 
There's going to be times where I walk on a university campus or Macy walks on a university campus and we try to communicate God's love and it's not received in the way that we want it to. And we've all experienced this, right? This was a reality for Paul. And what's so interesting, he says, five times I received from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Paul was a Jew. That was Paul's kinsman. Have you ever been betrayed by a brother or sister that you thought was in Christ? Or maybe a physical brother and sister for what you believe? This was a reality for Paul. We're going to see how Paul viewed this. But if you and I are going to live our lives in such a way as to direct people's attention to the God of the universe, to the God who sent his only son, the only God who sent the divine to the created, that you and I need to live with a passion and a zeal the way that the apostle Paul did. Finally, if you and I are going to live in that way, we need to have a divine mission. Verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. We have a divine mission. There's a few things that I want to point out, but I, I just want to pause and point out this one aspect of our divine mission. Paul says that he was called by his grace, God's grace. Stick with me here. This is like kind of a mind bender, but it's so good. What Paul is communicating, that, that word grace literally means a benefit. So we look at Paul's life. The terrorist Paul who was rounding up Christians to throw them in prison receives a revelation of Jesus Christ filled with the Spirit. And now Paul says that he's called me by his grace. So that word is benefit, and it refers to the individual who gave that benefit, meaning God. So what Paul is saying that even in the midst of all this trial and all this turmoil that he's facing that we just looked at, Paul still viewed his mission as a benefit. Why? Because the revelation of who Jesus was in his life was so strong that he viewed it as a benefit that now my life's mission is to communicate the gospel to those around me. When was the last time? We viewed that mission as a benefit. It's a benefit. It's very difficult to communicate in words the God who created everything that we see, his primary mode for communicating his gospel is through each and every one of us. What a benefit that we have to communicate hope in the midst of darkness. I'm going to have my wife come up and she's going to share a little bit about how this benefit has compelled us to move into university campuses. And really, it was this revelation. It was hearing stories of how the Lord has transformed the hearts and minds of students that compelled Macy and I to say, we've got to go. We've got to go to a place that so many people do not want to go for a number of reasons because these students desperately need to hear the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. Um, I just want to start out by telling you guys a story. There was a girl named Danny. And she is a college student at a college near our home in Springfield, Missouri. So that college is MSU, is what it's called, Missouri State University. And Danny had been through a lot in her life. Um, she had been abused as a child, had just a really difficult upbringing and family. And so 
for her as a child who had grown up in a terrible situation, she had always looked at college as this like start over point, this bright light where she would get to totally change her life, be a new person, um, and have just a, a fresh start. And so she came to MSU as a freshman with that idea in mind. She was so excited about what college was going to be for her. But as she came to college, as she began to get started, within the first week of moving into the dorms, she decided that this um, start over, this bright light that she'd been looking forward to was not all she had imagined it to be in her head. She had begun to have a really hard time making friends. Her relationship with her roommate wasn't going very well. And she just began to feel like, you know what, this was my last hope. This was my my start over chance and it's not working out for me. And so she shared this story with us several months ago. And when she did, she said that that made her fall into a deeper depression than she had even been in before. And so she began to just decide that it wasn't worth it, that the thing she had looked forward to wasn't working and nothing else was going to work. And she decided she was actually going to end her life. And so she had a plan. She had a way to do this, and she was walking on campus, on MSU campus, to the bookstore where she was going to get the supplies to do this. And as she was walking, the enemy had a purpose for her life, but we believe that God also had a purpose for her life. And in that moment, he saw her, he knew her, and he encountered her. And just like John said, he chooses to do that through people. So some girls, some Chi Alpha girls who had been discipled through our ministry went to her on a golf cart. They were driving on their way to a Chi Alpha event, and they pulled up beside her, and they didn't know what was going on in Danny's life. They didn't even know Danny, but they just felt prompted to pull up beside her, and they said, hey, we're going to this event. Hop in the golf cart. Come with us. Are you busy? Like, come on. And she just kept rejecting them. She kept saying, no. I'm not interested, I don't want to, but they were very persistent. And Danny told us that she decided to get in the golf cart, fully intending to still do what she had planned to do that day, uh, but she just wanted to get these girls off her back. So she gets in the golf cart, and these girls begin to drive with her, and as they're driving, they just started telling her about their college experience and how things had been hard when they had first come, and she was like, man, that's me too. But then they began to share about this ministry where they had made friends, they had met Jesus, and their lives had been radically changed. And so as Danny listened to these girls, a light bulb went off in her head. And she said, you know what, I think I'm going to give it one more try. I think I'm going to go with these girls to this event and just see what happens. And so she went with them, and they spent time with her so late that night that she was exhausted. So she went home, fell asleep. And she woke up the next morning to a text from these girls, and they said, hey, we want to hang out with you again tonight. And so seven days in a row, they spent time with her. They just began to share hope with her, to share Jesus with her, and eventually Danny was saved. She was discipled through this ministry. She was baptized, and then she became a leader in Chi Alpha. She got to see other people baptized. She actually baptized one of the girls that she led to Jesus. Yeah, and now she is a special education teacher fulfilling her purpose. And I mean, this girl is dynamic. She's such a smiley, fun, beautiful girl. And just like I said, the enemy had a purpose for her. He had a plan to end her life. And actually, in other ways as well, she's had medical conditions and things that she's been prayed for and radically healed. This girl has a purpose on her life. And the enemy had one plan, but God has another plan. And so we feel, just like John was just preaching, that it's our benefit, that it's our privilege by God's grace to get to go to students like Danny and to encounter them when they're in the midst of the enemy's plan for their life and to say, there's a better purpose for you. God has a better purpose for you, and we are sent here to to share that with you. And so we are going with Chi Alpha to plant a brand new Chi Alpha chapter at a school in Indianapolis called IUPUI. And so this is a brand new campus that has not had a Chi Alpha. Um, There's 30,000 students there. So there are students like Danny all over this campus who need hope, who need a friend, who need somebody to come alongside them and share the gospel. And so we get to go and do that. um, And we're just just so excited. 
so honored and so speechless, honestly, that the Lord would select us to go and minister to these students who are so close to our age, so close in age. And can I say this before before we go? Um, this place is very instrumental in my walk with the Lord. And at times, I know, I feel like when I'm doing ministry, it seems like nothing's happening. It seems like you're just tilling rocks. You know what I mean? Anybody else out there? Or it just seems like, Am I making any difference here, Lord? What the heck is going on, you know? But can I say that you are making a difference? That my life, this this place is a testament of a difference in in what the Lord has, has called us to do. And so we're going to pray, and then Pastor Kevin is, is going to come up, but you are making a difference. Can I remind you that your life isn't a happenstance, that your life isn't always going to look easy. My life did not always look easy. My life is full of brokenness. If you want to hear more about it, we can talk more about it. But can I tell you that the gospel still rings true, and it doesn't matter what your past looks like. And this may seem rudimentary. It may seem basic, and it may just be a reminder that God still has a mission and a plan for your life and he still sees you and he loves you and it doesn't matter what you've done. My life is a testament of that. That it doesn't matter what you've done. If you will surrender your life to him, he's going to give you a grace and a peace that is far beyond your wildest dreams. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that without the message of the gospel, we would be nothing. I ask right now, Lord, that you would move in such a powerful way that your spirit would rest here in this place, that you would remind my friends, my brothers and sisters, that you love them, that you see them, that you care about them, whether they're in the building now or watching online. Father, you are a good God. I thank you that your goodness is running after us. We love you, Father. We thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. How many were just blessed by that? That's awesome awesome when you see folks uh, wanting to just go and do what God wants them to do.